finally the decision was made uh, to embark upon that gargantuan project of sewering that city. No one had done anything like that before, except maybe the Romans well, well before, but certainly no one within living memory. And when you read the accounts of what it was like to embark upon that project, it was rather like us, I think, thinking about sending a man to the moon in the middle of the last century. It was, it was a great enterprise. It was going to cost a lot. And it's really interested me it, it, to try to understand why people decided to do it. After all, it was going to be to their financial detriment. Uh, it was a, a massive project with uncertain and long-term outcomes. But people did it. And the reason I think, after reading extensively around that subject, the reason I think it was done was just that people felt it was the right thing to do. You know, those, there, there's, there's, a, there's a certain sense in our hearts about what is right and wrong, and people at that stage felt it was the right thing to do, and so the project was begun. Mind you, I can't imagine what London would be like today if they decided that it wasn't all that important. <laughs> New York would have been the global centre of capital. I don't know. Anyway, it's an aside. But it does give me hope to think about this pollution problem we face as a pollution problem. Of course, climate change is a very special kind of pollution problem. It's an air pollution problem. And in order to understand why that's so important, we need to know something about this atmosphere of ours. The atmosphere, I think, has to be the most taken for granted element of our planet. Um, just the very name, the atmosphere, you know. It, my old aunt used to come and visit us occasionally and one of her favourite sayings was, oh, you could have cut the atmosphere with a knife, you know. She's talking about the atmosphere between two people or we talk about the atmosphere in a room, you know, or, or the atmosphere of the planet. Just the use of that word for anything from the smallest amount of air through to the whole planet's worth reveals something about our disregard for this organ of our planet. And yet what a wonderful and wondrous and necessary thing it is. I mean, from the moment that some anonymous doctor picked us up by the heels and whacked us on the bum to get us to take our first gulp from this great aerial ocean of ours, to the moment we breathe our last, we are plugged into it and connected with it in a way that we're not connected to any other part of our planet. It is the great interconnector of all living things. It connects us with the oceans. It connects us with the rocks beneath our feet. It is, it's the great moderator, the great interconnector, the great enabler of life on this planet. In the 19th century, you know, when people were discovering the wonders of the atmosphere, one of my great heroes came up with a better name, I think, for it, and I've already used the name. Uh, the man was Alfred Russell Wallace, co-founder of the theory of evolution with Charles Darwin. And he described this atmosphere of ours as the great aerial ocean. And I love that phrase, because when I think of the atmosphere as an aerial ocean, I can imagine the currents in it that bring us our weather. And I can think of myself as a as a sort of an insignificant creature crawling around on the bottom of the great aerial ocean as totally dependent upon it as any fish is on the sea. It's also important to me because it really invites a very important comparison. When we look into the heavens, we think that, or we can imagine the atmosphere just goes on forever and it doesn't really matter what we throw into it. A bit as Dr. William Gray said, human impact's just too small. In order to understand why that's wrong, we've got to carry out a bit of a thought experiment and imagine, if we could, compressing all of the gases in this great aerial ocean a thousand times until they become a liquid. We need, we'd need to do that because air is about a thousand times less dense than, than water. If you could carry out that thought experiment and then imagine comparing the oceans with the great aerial ocean, what you'd discover is that this atmosphere of ours is only one five hundredth the size of the oceans, one five hundredth. And that explains so much to me of recent environmental history. You know, us humans, um, we've always believed there's a, a, a way that we can throw stuff to. And so, you know, until recently, when I say recently, last few decades, the city of New York used to just barge its rubbish out into the Atlantic Ocean and dump it overboard. So many cities around the world still just drain their sewage straight into the oceans. And the Russians, God bless their cotton socks, you know, they, they've been busy secretly throwing whole nuclear reactors into the ocean, not telling anyone about it. I mean, you know, so, but, but for all of that abuse that the oceans have received at our hands, we haven't suffered a global oceanic pollution crisis. Why is that? Just because the oceans are so big. The difference between pollution, polluting the oceans and the atmosphere is a bit like having um, a house with a leaky septic tank, you know, in one case running into a tiny creek, 
and the other case into a mighty river. It doesn't matter if it's running into the mighty river. If it's running into a little creek, it can have a huge impact. Over my lifetime, I'm 51 years old, um, the history of atmospheric air pollution has been dismal. I've lived through three, as have many of the people in this audience, three separate and distinct global or near global air pollution problems. The first of those problems, which will probably be familiar to people here, became known as the acid rain problem. I don't know whether you remember it here, but in the 1970s, um, you know, people were disturbed to find great tracts of forests and lakes and soils across the northern hemisphere uh, dying. And the reason wasn't immediately evident. It turned out that the cause was the burning of fossil fuels, particularly coal, with a high sulphur content. And that sulphur would go up into the atmosphere with the flue gas when you burnt the coal, combine with moisture in the atmosphere and fall to the, to the earth as sulfuric acid, where it would scald the life out of anything that it contacted. If I could just take a little sidetrack here, so I don't want to bore you, but why was sulphur in the coal? Well, there's a lot of complex reasons for that, but one point I want to make is that coal is a sponge. Anything that's mobile that flows through the Earth's crust tends to accumulate in coal. So cadmium, mercury, um, uranium, you'll find lots of it in coal. You know, we, one of the reasons people here maybe, or I'm not sure whether this is an Australian problem or not, but women are generally recommended not to eat too much fish while they're pregnant because it's full of mercury. That mercury comes from the burning of coal, the great majority of it. How it gets into the fish is a long story. I haven't got time to go through here, but it comes from the coal. In my country of Australia, where there's lots of uranium in the coal, the biggest point sources of emissions for radiation are coal-fired power plants. They're not the world's biggest uranium mines, which we have in our country. It's coal-fired power plants. And lung cancer rates around those power plants are a third higher generally than elsewhere in the country. Just to get back to the acid rain problem, once people realised what was going on, um, they brought in regulations uh, to make those coal-fired power plants put scrubbers on the smokestacks of the, um, uh, of the plants. And a very ingenious man, a man called Richard Sandor, who established the Chicago Climate Exchange, came up with the idea of trading in pollutants. And that might sound counterintuitive to a lot of people in the audience, but we can't change things overnight. So the idea of licensing someone to pollute but charging them is a very powerful incentive to change. And it's also great in terms of making sure you get the best bang for your buck, if you want, when you're dealing with these pollutants, because the person who can um, most cost-effectively afford to reduce their pollutants can sell their credits to other people. As a result of those sort of moves, within a couple of years, really, um, the acid rain problem was a receding threat. You know, sulphur only lasts a couple of hours, or if the air's very dry, a couple of days in the atmosphere. And so once the sulphur stopped being emitted, Earth could heal itself. Um, I should just say that that fact, the short time span of sulphur in the atmosphere prevented the problem from being a truly global one. That's why I call it a near global pollution problem. <coughs> but the wondrous thing is, you know, once we stopped putting that sulphur into the atmosphere, Earth started to heal itself. And I just think we, we just don't give enough credit for the astonishing capacity of this home of ours to heal itself when it's severely damaged. I, we just seem to accept it as normal. I think it's a miracle, quite frankly, and a wondrous miracle that allows us to maintain ourselves on this planet. And it's something we need to know so much more about as we move into this century of ours where we're going to be putting ever more pressure on this environment of ours. Tim Flannery speaking in Santa Fe. He's discovered more than 60 species, has been named 2007 Australian of the Year, the author of a number of books, his latest, The Weathermakers, The History and Future Impact of Climate Change. We'll be back with Tim Flannery in a minute. Yeah.